everyone and welcome to MHTV. Tonight we're talking about bereavement with our episode Grief Encounter and um, we're here with our guest Stacey Hart who will introduce herself in a moment. But first I'll hand you over to Nikki who can let you know how you can watch and how you can get involved. Okay, Hello everybody, good evening. So just in case you're watching on the Facebook Live, obviously you can type straight into the comments there, that's no problem. And if you're um, being engaged and you're looking at this via Twitter, then if you just put in the hashtag MHTV, we'll be able to see what you're saying. So please feel free to ask us any questions um, and let us know all your thoughts as we go along. Thank you. Back to Vanessa. Thank you. Thanks very much. And um, Stacey, um, I wonder if we could just start by maybe doing a little bit of an introduction about the um, the bereavement work that you're doing for people who are listening tonight. So um, a little bit about how you got into it. Well, so I'm not really sure how I got into it. I've been a therapist for over 20 <laughs> years now. And for some unknown reason, I always found myself in the field of bereavement, even early on, even when I was studying so 12 years ago, um, I had so I had my kids and I decided to go back to work and um, I saw a little advert in a local paper that Grief and Council wanted therapists to work with children. So I went for an interview, I got the job 12 years ago and at the time the charity was really small. So it was run by our founder, Shelley Gilbert, in her house, almost around her kitchen table with a few therapists. <laughs> And as the charity grew, I kind of grew with it, I suppose. I took on new roles. So um, I was a family programs manager for a few years. And I was always training. Shelley and I were always training up and down the country. She had great contacts. We even went to Milan to set up a charity there, a bereavement charity. And 12 years on, I'm training manager and um the charity has now grown to a national level and especially through Amazing. COVID has pushed it out mm. there completely because um, there's I been bet. so many changes in the charity. So we can, we're can we working on Zoom now because we couldn't see clients face to face. So what happened mm. was we've got referrals on our website and our helpline on our website. So it's gone national now. So um everyone knows about us and we are one of the leading bereavement charities yeah that's amazing isn't it it's an amazing story i mean i think thinking back to some of my own clinical work and um, there hasn't always 
grief is something that isn't often touched on, is it? And um, and certainly, you know, like thinking in, in mental health about sometimes people who might present with depression and then it becomes quite clear that actually it's bereavement related and somebody hasn't dealt with, you know, a period of loss or had the opportunity to talk about it or process it or it's been too difficult or traumatic. Well, I think that's why it was set up because our inspirational founder, Shelley Gilbert, mm-hmm. she was bereaved as a child. Her mum died when she was four and her oh. dad died when she was nine and she was adopted mm-hmm. by an amazing family who um, her three cousins became her brothers. But no one ever spoke about the dark side. Conversations were ahead at mm-hmm. home. And as she got older, she trained as a therapist and she saw this pattern going on with so many children. Mm -hmm. No one was talking about it. Parents didn't want to upset the children. Children didn't want to upset the parents. So it was brushed under the carpet and it became a really taboo Mm -hmm. subject. So she decided to make it different for other children, thousands of Mm -hmm. other children. And here we are now. Yeah. So how do um, how would children and families find out about the service that you offer if, if somebody was looking for some support? So when we started, we were very much a local charity. Um, so mm. we were in the borough of Barnet. Now, I suppose if you Google bereavement support, um, we're very well known because we've got a reach. Yeah. Because of our helpline, um, mm. lots of people know about us through our press, through our fundraising. And, you know, the referral process is really easy now because people can refer yeah. online, whereas it used to be when we were smaller, it was kind of like phone up and we had billing mm. forms and backwards and forwards. But now everything's so much easier because of our helpline, which runs five days a week, Monday to Friday. Um, there's always some at the end of the phone or the end of instant chat. So it just it's a much easier process and we are there to have those conversations about death and we are there mm. to kind of bring it into the open so people don't have to suffer in silence. Yeah yeah that's great and you mentioned um, about you being the training manager so um, what does that role involve? Is that is that focused on training other people in asking about bereavement or is that focused more, well, more widely? Well, it's focused widely oh. now. Um, it, it's really funny because I've been training manager for a good few years now, and it was really difficult to um, go into schools and do insets, set days of training because they'd be like, oh, we only have, you know, eight bereaved children in our school. We don't have that many. Yeah. But as soon as COVID struck, the elephant came out the room and I was getting phone yeah. calls and emails and I've been up and down the country. And it was really frightening because I've always worked face to face and experientially and all of a sudden I was working in my kitchen over a computer but I seem to turn it around really well and it really works and people really connect with it so I use breakout rooms I can still Mm -hmm. make it interactive I can still make it fun because I think with death Mm -hmm. you have to have a bit of fun it can't be all doom and gloom yeah so um, it's worked really, really well. Mm. I've trained at universities and we do have a Middlesex accredited course as well, Good Grief Training, that we've been running for seven years. Great. I suppose this is how like, I connected mm-hmm. to Nikki. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to say a bit about that programme? While we're here, that sounds quite yeah, so what that we're is. Kind of, we're kind of in the middle now of revamping it, so hopefully to run next year, because we've really realised, especially now the landscape of bereavement has completely changed, and we kind yeah, of put in yeah. more things like suicide and traumatic death, because that's what's happening now. Yeah. And, you know, I don't mean to sound funny, but when kind of I first started, our referrals were... It's wrong to say ordinary deaths, but, you know, dad died of a heart attack. Now we get lots more Mm. um, traumatic homicides, suicides. So we have to kind of really incorporate a lot more of that in our training now. Yeah. 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 And is that, who's that aimed at, the Middlesex training? Well, it's, they can get 30 points towards a master's degree so it'd be aimed at anybody really who wanted to put it towards um, a degree. Yeah that's great. Um, Nikki do you want to come in at this point with anything? 
I think uh, it's really interesting to think about how um, how COVID has shifted the kind of parameters that people are willing to talk mm-hmm. about death. And I wonder if you've got, I mean, having had so much experience, if you perhaps like to talk to us a little bit about talking about death, because even I think mental health professionals, you know, our, our whole aim is for us not to get to a stage where we need to talk about it. You know, so I guess, could you tell us a little bit about some of the, just the, some of the lessons that you've learned about talking about death, like how to go about it in a way that would be really helpful? Absolutely. Um, I always kind of, so when I do my training, I always mm. do, the first thing I do is I get everyone to name as many phrases um, as they can, or euphemisms around death. So we can make them funny, but hit mm. the bucket. But it's a really interesting story, actually, um, that um, a few months ago, I had on a lady on a webinar, and she was in her 50s, and we talked about, you know, the words we use for death. And mm. she said, when I was a child, Child, I used to go to my grandparents' house and there was a picture on their mental mantelpiece of a baby. And I always used to say, who's that baby? And they said, that's your sister. We lost her before you were born. Her parents mm-hmm. hadn't told her anything. Mm-hmm. So she took that literally and she said she spent her whole childhood looking for this child that was lost. Mm-hmm. And on the other aspect, she said that ever whenever she went shopping or anywhere with her mum, she used to hold onto her hand tight because she didn't want to get lost mm-hmm. as well. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, those are the sort of things we talk about, how to talk about death. Um, when I'm speaking in schools and mm-hmm. you have teachers who, who might be maths teachers, English teachers, how to be able to acknowledge when children talk about death, how to be able to be empathic and listen and make them feel safe and make them feel hurt and know that there is somewhere to go and that it's mm-hmm. okay to talk about death. I think, as we said before COVID, it was, um, you know, it was a taboo subject. Then all of a sudden, for the last year and a half, every day we turn on the television, the first word we hear is um, yeah. 150 people died or somebody. That's all we heard about death, <laughs> yeah. our newspaper, our social media. Mm. So it's kind of, I think, brought it more into the open. And that's a great thing because one sure yeah. thing is that we're all going to die. And I think it should be something that is spoken about in families, in the household. Mm. and it's not a subject that should be avoided mm. why do you think people avoid it so much because you exactly as you say i mean we communicate in such a twisted way around it just to avoid saying the word that would actually make it much clearer what do you think it is at the heart of that kind of avoidance uh, i think that you know i think us ourselves even as adults we're frightened to death we we don't know too much about it. We know our body start, stops working, but we don't know what happens. It's confusing for adults. It's confusing for children. And it's yeah. also really final. And I think maybe as adults, even though I would say I'm a death ex- expert, doesn't mean that I'm not frightened of death and other people mm. dying around me too. So mm. I, I understand it. There's a real yeah. fear of upsetting people as well, particularly maybe kids. Or thinking that yeah. children don't understand. Yeah, I always say that you can never upset a child more than they're upset already. So we don't like to see yeah. children cry, um, yeah. but they're upset, they're hurting on the inside anyway. Yeah. So you can't upset a child more about when you talk about death. I think it's us as adults that are just frightened and we don't like to see children hurting or crying. So I think that's why Mm. we avoid it. It's like that old adage, isn't it, of the woman whose husband died and the other woman crosses the road because they don't know what to say or haven't got the right words. But sometimes there are no words. Sometimes it's just a bit of empathy, isn't it? A tap on the shoulder or, you know, a a hold of your hand. Yeah, one of the things for me as a parent is um is you know a death of a pet, you know, yeah. um, you know, that can really rock a child, you know, from personal experience. So yeah, yeah. Do you cover that kind of thing with not know, really? We we just do parents and siblings, but um as I was working in the school today, um we looked at mm-hmm. losses and I said you don't have to use death 
because you know you need to look after yourself so I said you know when you lose your mobile phone and a lot of people did say death of a pet but what was a main right. subject in one of the classes which was really cute was um lots of teddy bears life with teddy bears oh. being um on holiday so oh. you know but that's a great way to get children Absolutely. to understand the concept of loss so they yeah. understand how it feels and that can make them more empathic towards other people and friends mm. Yeah, because it's very much about attachment and bonding, isn't it, really? I Absolutely. Think that's, you know, whether that's to a pet or a teddy bear or a, mm-hmm. or a person. Um, the other thing I was sat thinking about was, um, do you, uh, was around supporting people before death as well. So um, supporting a young person who's maybe got a family member on, you know, going through end of life care, for example. Do you do work at that end of the spectrum as well? We don't because for the simple reason that yeah. was such an overrun service anyway, that if Too we much. kind of thought that yeah. in it's a whole new massive concept yeah. but absolutely yeah. on our helpline we would mm. definitely speak to people and you know preparing for death is something really really different and um you always find that you can prepare all you like but you know people hold the hope I think until that final moment yeah 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 Yeah. Nikki anything coming through on social media I guess the things that are there is a sort of bits and bobs but this idea about um what to say and what not to say seems to be a theme and that's something yeah. that people are very worried about I think but that comes back to that saying the wrong thing what if you could just speak briefly to that so I, I think what what to say is um, I acknowledge how you're feeling. Um, you know, I you know I think it's best to take it from them. We we don't know everyone grieves so differently and uniquely that I think to say to people you know um, oh I've experienced this before isn't a great thing to say. Um, I know how you feel isn't a great thing to say but I think it's always good sometimes to just listen and you know kind of be there emotionally show that you're with them I think empathy can be shown in many ways and Mm. um, it's really hard to find the right words you might want to ask them what support they have so if you're with somebody do you have anybody who can support you do you have a network of friends I think it's always great if you can signpost them services as well Um, but I think sometimes you know just to be young people just be there some young people people don't want to talk and they just need some space and time and I think that's really important as well to acknowledge that and you know I was taught 25 years ago when I was training to just try to kind of think about what this person's going through walk in their shoes be in that world you know it's very difficult to give um advice yeah. But you can kind of maybe help them think about what mm. they have around them um, and what they can do. Um, with young people, I always think there's something called a happiness toolkit, which I really mm. like as well, because it can't be all doom and gloom. You know, there has to be positives because at the end of the day, they've still got to get up and show up. And so we, so you need to think about that as well. So kind of, you know, to be part of something um to, to to look after themselves, you know, to look after their bodies, to look after their That's mind. Awesome. Um, young people can often get involved in, you know, risk-taking behaviour as well. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. to limit that. You know what, Vanessa and Nikki, we cannot mm-hmm. wave a magic wand. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. But what we can do is we can yeah. moderately protect the bereaved you know, and kind of help them. But if you ask any bereaved child what they want, and they say, um, I want my mum back. Yeah. Class, yeah. Really difficult, isn't it? And you can understand why that makes adults trying to help so anxious and so distressful. Them. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I would say don't try to find a magic word. I mean, as I said, I've been in the bereavement field for so many years. And, and you know, I, I can't say that I have these magic words that I can just give and say, yeah. if you say this, it will be okay, because it won't be. Mm. And it's, you know, a process. And, you know, you've got to remember also, 
grieving isn't over in a day or week or a year you know another question that I get asked the most is like how long do people grieve for some Mm -hmm. people grieve forever I remember Shelly our founder I won't tell you how old she is but she says that her mum died when she was four and she was still going to a card shop on Mother's Day and have a little cry Mm -hmm. and that's okay Mm -hmm. People are a bit, yeah. a tiny bit more sensitive about that now. You know, when you get the direct marketing mm-hmm. and stuff, you can opt out of stuff on Mothers and Fathers Day and things like that. Yes. yes. So you're absolutely right that we need to be really careful about how we look after ourselves and each other at those mm-hmm. sorts of times. Yes. And not make an assumption that everyone's having the same experience because they're, they're not. Yeah, absolutely. And a, yeah. Another thing you said that really sort of struck home to me was the kind of physical health side of it. Because the last time I was bereaved, what I really had forgotten because you do, don't, when it's so painful, you just put it away from yourself. It was how exhausting it is. How exhausting yeah. it is to be sad for ages and cry all the time. Yeah. And like, just even like getting a cup of tea for yourself, just like such an effort. That if those little things actually do make a difference and you do yeah. notice the people who, who turn around and just cut you some slack, you really do notice that. And yeah. even if you don't yeah. say anything at the time, you remember it later and you make sure you kind of pay that kind of behaviour forward. Um, I've got a couple of comments on here, if that's all right, Vanessa, can I pop yeah. them those? Yeah, yeah, um, go You've ahead. got... Amy, um, hi Ronnie, it's Aunt Amy waving <laughs> some hellos and waves. Um, and a um, question from Alfonso, it's fantastic. Hello, Alfonso, saying, how do you embed cultural competence in your training? So from the perspective of nurses um, providing end-of-life care uh, to patients and families. Okay, so, um, yeah, so we, we need to kind of think about different cultures and we need to make ourselves open to it. So, um For instance, um, you know, everyone grieves differently. Everybody has different grieving rituals. And we obviously have to be accepting of what people's rituals are. And look, we don't know about every culture, but kind of just be open to what they want and what they need. Um, So, you know, we have, um, you know, a diverse range of families that come to us. And, um, you know, we respect what they feel and what they think and religion, Mm. culture and so on. And I think that's really important. Mm, I think so, too. Are there any differences in the way that you support children to the way that you might support adults? Well, I think, yeah, how we work with children is different. So I'm Mm. very much into um, working with um, books. So we have, for instance, um, the grief book, which Shelley wrote, and it's got loads of interactive um, kinds of different pages that you can do that children can write in. And I think it's really important to use as many resources you can. Um, I collaborated on a book with DK Books called Lost in the Clouds, which is a book for seven-year-olds. So sometimes I think it's great to kind of bring in books. Um, Also, you know, to be creative in your work. So when you're working with children, they might not have the words to express. So give them, you know, pens, give them paper, colours, and, you know, just give them whatever you can to kind of just make it easy for them to express themselves. Adults, you know, absolutely. I mean, so many times I've given paints to adults and they're like, I can't paint, I can't draw. Yeah. But actually, when they get down to it and they start going for it, they absolutely love it. And kind mm. of, it does kind of help them make their unconscious conscious. So um, mm. it's a good mm. thing to do. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, I think for me that touches on you know why um, a, a sort of whole school approach is important as well around bereavement awareness. Because sometimes I think that you know children are expected to compartmentalise things when they go to school and and perform and focus on their education, whereas a, a child might be really struggling with with bereavement, but not like an adult unable to verbalise it. Um, but often, as we know, it comes out in different ways with children, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I think, Vanessa, you're so right. So many people make assumptions that, you know, mm. children are resilient, they bounce back, mm. children don't grieve, or also, mm. um, you know, they'll be okay. What's the good about, you know, opening up all old wounds? And and also mm. always say that, you know, most of our referrals, grief and counts, especially in the old days when we were smaller, came in from the schools where the children were kicking off in the playground and they were angry. But it's always a child at the back of the class who's been 
being quiet and well behaved as a child that you know that that we need to watch because they might be suffering in silence the mm. others you know they're kind of a little bit more acting out so we know that you know they they need the help yeah mm. it's yeah, interesting that idea that people would miss see it and the idea that people don't see grief they see naughtiness or lack of yeah. concentration or withdrawal yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, you know, it's very common for children and young people to display anger. Mm. And um, I do think that is something that is picked up at schools or, as you say, kind of maybe not doing their work or, or actually maybe they need, you know, bereavement help and it's picked up. But, you know, it's that little girl who's sitting there all good and well behaved that might yeah. be suffering the most. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And as a charity, have you done work with, with schools, with the education teams and teachers? And yeah. So um, I, I really love partnering with schools. So um, recently we partnered with a school um, who are in Surrey and they have a foundation for um, children who've been um, abandoned and bereaved. Yeah. So I really love doing a whole day in sets because I think it's really important that every teacher kind of has yeah. some tools up their sleeve to work with it and kind of have some understanding of the impact of bereavement. As I said, I worked in a school today. I've written, um, which you can download, I think possibly from our website, a PSHE lesson for Key right. Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. Um, so um, we do we do have like loads of different resources that, you know, people can tap into that can be really helpful. And as I said on our website, we've got really good grief guides so um i've written down some of the grief guides so you know just tips and advice sudden death death of a grandparent parent children for loss um there's there's lots of different guides that you know sometimes it's just quite good to read them and i think sometimes even though you you kind of know your staff it's good just to kind of check it out as well yeah. We'll be retweeting all that, so don't worry anybody if you're wondering how to get hold of this stuff. Yes. If you look at the hashtag from its TV, you'll see um, all kinds of um, information that we're tweeting out as we go through. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I and think we'll there's resources. To, um, yeah. yeah. We're coming up to it, half seven, aren't we, already? Mm. This conversation's <laughs> flying past, isn't it? Yeah, I know. So, it's quick. Yeah. So I think, as Nikki says, we will share the resources on social media. So for people who want those resources, them, we'll share a, a little link to them. And also, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but our helpline isn't just for children. It is for anybody who's been bereaved. Yeah. So that's why it's so fantastic. And um, in lockdown, it kind of went mad because lots yeah, of people nice. were at home and focusing on their bereavements. And um, when we first went into lockdown, I, I was yeah. on the helpline for um, a little bit. And, and it was really difficult because mm -hmm. um, I had calls from children who were absolutely terrified of COVID. You know, mm -hmm. dad had died and then they're living yeah. what happens if something happens to mum. Um, and also kind of just, you know, not being able to kind of reach out to their grandparents and yeah. being in it. It's really, really frightening because don't forget these children who have been bereaved, that they live in fear anyway of, oh, yeah. you know, the world around them. The worst thing, the most terrible thing that can happen to them has happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, you know, it was just really scary, scary time for them. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I've got a couple more questions coming through, if oh. that's okay, just before we yeah, head out. Right. That's right. So one yeah. of them is about, um, uh, it's a quite old question, but it's basically about, you know, how do you approach the, the situation when there's been a suicide in a school? And that can be quite triggering for people. So if that's not something that you're ready to uh, mm. be engaged in, do step away. Um, but for people that are, I think it's, it's a question that is something of a worry, isn't it? Okay, so um, it, it's not funny you should ask mm. that, but mm. um, it's something that I do. So I do critical incident and trauma management, mm. and there has been suicides in local schools where I have been in um, to kind of help the management team at the school set up a pathway for the teachers, for themselves, and for the students. So um, first of all, it needs to be managed. Um, you know, children need to be told in small groups. And there's always a rush because um, before it gets on social media and they need to be able to tell the 
you know, the young people in a contained atmosphere. Then um, obviously an email has to go home to parents and um, the email will tell them what's happened and to tell them to keep a watchful eye on their children that night because of suicide yeah. ideation. Yeah. And, um, and then we normally set up support rooms. So mm. grief encounter have been in schools. So where we set up rooms where young people and children can come and just talk to counsellors. And normally that lasts for about three days. And from that, we might pick up young people who need to be referred to us or discuss mm, yeah. at the school if there's any safeguarding issues or if there's young people that have to have, you know, further input or mm. support. So um, I've been doing that for a good few years now and with mm. some other charities, um, I've written a guide, um, which is a suicide response guide for schools. Yeah. Um, I'll see if I can share that with you possibly yeah, tomorrow absolutely. and you can put that mm. out. Mm. And it kind of gives you all the tips like what to say to... Um, you know, what to say to the children, um, press releases. It really covers everything. Memorials after, you know, just after the yeah. death or a year yeah. after. So um, it's happening more and more, I know. I think that's really a really great thing to hear. I, I mean, do. even now with the guidance, you still see some extremely irresponsible reporting and language yeah. being used around suicide. And even yes. I think, obviously, social media is still very much a wilder and more free and open place, even despite not everyone's best wills to be, to be able to treat each other with respect and compassion at difficult times. You still see some very odd phrasing and odd descriptions around deaths by suicide and yeah. things that are very unhelpful and hurtful still, I think, to people. And it yeah. it's amazes me that we've we've always lived with this and we still get it so wrong. I know, yeah. but I think um, hopefully slowly the world is learning mm. and we have always lived with this, but I think mm. um, it's become more of a common theme. What I have noticed, mm. I don't know if it's the growth of grief encounter or mm. the growth of death by suicide, but mm. um, it, it is pretty frightening. And, mm. you know, for young people and children, it's very 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 difficult mm. and for the parent to be able to tell the child um mm. you know how their parent died it's mm. it's never easy yeah. I think one of the things that happens when I mean, from my perspective as well when experiencing that kind of grief is it makes you feel so isolated like that nobody else can understand and add that on top of a teenager or young person's experience of already feeling like nobody understands you it yeah. must be extremely bewildering and frightening experience and also the taboo that goes with it you know and yeah. you know what people are thinking mm. and you know also that guilt is there anything mm. I could have done mm. and it's you know really difficult to make what to say no there is nothing that you could have done it's not your fault mm. 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 and um, it does come with a lot of self-blame which is really yeah absolutely do you use any particular kind of creative methods I don't think nothing mindfulness or anything like that to to help sort of to commit those connections. Yeah, well, I think mindfulness is always good. Um, we have set up in the past a bereavement by suicide group. Mm. Um, so you know, just to kind of take into account that maybe you know there's a slight difference between you know I don't like saying a normal bereavement and suicide, but another bereavement and suicide. So um, yeah, so we're very aware of it as a charity, um, an organisation, and me personally, uh, it's something that um, kind of just needs a little bit more understanding yeah one of the things i think is important which links to what nikki was saying about isolation and also what we're saying about the taboo is that you know when so when a young person dies through suicide that there is an opportunity to you know to bring people together and talk about the person's life and and to celebrate life because that's you know something that's sometimes missed in in the trauma of everything and I think, you know, where I've had experiences professionally, where we've had that opportunity to bring people together and actually celebrate a person's life. And whether that's, you know, a group that's very inclusive of teachers talking about the person, mm. young people talking about the person and family, you know, that's been really powerful. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, um, the landscape over the last hundred years since Freud, who wanted us to let go of um, the dead person mm -hmm. to now where we hold on and we continue Absolutely. bonds and we remember that person. Mm -hmm. And this is something mm -hmm. we're really big on at Grief Encounter, memories, memory boxes, celebrating mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. um, continuing those bonds by going to the person's favourite place, going to the cemetery, letting off balloons, um, yeah. just you know, mm. thinking about them. And it's also okay now, um, things have changed, it's okay to kind of speak to the dead person and ask their advice and kind of feel really connected to them. And mm. I think that's, you know, was probably the biggest change in the last hundred years. Um, mm. and, I, and I think that's wonderful because mm. we say to children that you don't have to let go that you know you can continue that bond there's the invisible string I don't mm. know if you know mm. that book but there's mm. you know there's still an attachment mm. with that person that died and mm. I think that makes people feel better because they mm. think um kids they oh I, I feel a bit weird I'm speaking to somebody who's dead but that's mm. okay yeah but well, that's not something we've learned from other cultures you know I yes. mean I can remember the first time we went to a non a non like white British funeral I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like the display of grief was so visceral compared to that kind of like stiff upper lip and that kind of sadness. And, you know, I think everyone finds their own path, don't they, what they feel comfortable with. But I have to yeah. say the noise that was coming out of other people was exactly the same kind of noise that if I made that, what I was in my heart would be the noise that I would make. Yeah. So I thought it was, I think it's really interesting isn't it, the idea that about the kind of cultural differences and cultural expectations yeah. and about finding some, finding your own way to, you don't stop loving people just because you can't see them. That's and I right. think the idea that you would expect someone to just like tidy away themselves and their emotions and their feelings, this is why people don't thrive. Mm -hmm. This is why people get sick, isn't it? Because it's not it's not natural to do that. We're holding it all in. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, as you say, you know, it's so cathartic to be able to scream and cry. Mm -hmm. And there are cultures, you know, you think of every culture, they do have kind of a different, at a funeral, a different way mm -hmm. of being or acting. Mm -hmm. Well, just being, yeah, just expressing their grief very viscerally. And that's, that's yes. brilliant. If that works for you, you feel better, even for a minute, go for it. It's brilliant. I guess I've got a couple more things. So uh, you did say how busy you were, but um, mm -hmm. there's someone was asking, can you make referrals to you? How do you do that? Okay, so it's really easy now. So on our website, mm -hmm. um, at the top, there's a bar, and I think it's support, and it drops down, and it's um, refer a child, a young person. And if you go into that, you can do it all online now. So um, the process is quite easy. You just need to fill out the form. It will come to us. Um, and as I said, you know, there there is, there is a little bit of a way at the moment because of um, just the number of referrals, but absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. On that Sharon note, up. could you? Yeah. On that note, could you refer a family to you for support as well? If you yeah. So family. what actually happens is because we are traditionally a children's charity. Yeah. Um, if we are seeing the child, we will see the adult. Yeah. So we won't see an adult without a child. Yeah. But we know to help the child, we have to work systemically now and work yeah. with the whole family. And it can't just be, um, you know, we see the child, we won't see anyone else. So absolutely. Yeah. Got another couple of questions coming in. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Always the way. <laughs> um, one is, um, did you have to make any adjustments to provide end of life care training during COVID-19? For example, were you able to support spirituality or cultural needs? Um, no, well, because end of life isn't something that we really do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we really acknowledged how, um, you know, different it was, you know, end of life because of COVID-19 that families couldn't get to see the mm -hmm. person that was dying and the isolation and people having to say goodbye on FaceTime and not being able yeah. to hold somebody's hand. So absolutely acknowledge that. Um, mm. and how difficult that's <laughs> made people, how more complex it's made people's yeah. grief because of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And one from Adrian, that was my office, so thank you, Frank, and for that. Um, and Adrian saying, it's interesting we teach um, across the lifespan, but still talking about death is can be taboo. Uh, the way in which we support grief, the individuals pre-grief and during grief is important. How can we improve this in healthcare education? 
So I think um, healthcare education, I, I do think it needs to have a bereavement element to it. Um, and I think especially the NHS need to be doing bereavement training. Um, and I think the last few years have taught us that in spades, isn't it? That we just need to be learning about death and dying. And if I had my way, we'd be teaching children very young from school. So we kind of grow up. Um, kind of having an understanding and feeling comfortable with the word dead and death. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that really struck me is I remember when I was first in practice and I was supervising a student who was talking to a family member that who's, who, whose relative had died and they said that he's gone to sleep and the person said, well, wake him up. And just like, yeah. Jesus, just say it, just say it. And he's gone away. He's gone away where? We'll get him back. And in the end, I just thought, I thought well, I can't cope with this. It's too much. I just step in and say, no, And no, you'd no. be surprised how many people still use the phrase gone to sleep. I mean, what's that saying to a child? I mean, how terrifying yeah. would it be to go to bed? To go to bed. <laughs> yeah, I think he might not wake yeah. up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. And also, you can say anything if you say it with with a good intention and a, and a, a compassion and the ability to say sorry if you've upset or frightened or hurt somebody. You yeah. know, so I think it's far better to speak and 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 try to connect than to just leave that awful silence hanging between people. Mm -hmm. and, and then because children don't always know know why something is painful or difficult, but they know that people are avoiding it and they start to attach all this like negativity to it and fear mm -hmm. of doing the wrong thing. And we teach kids, I think, by our behavior to be and afraid. Also, I think mm -hmm. their imaginations sometimes can be really worse than their the reality mm -hmm. as well. Um, so we just have to be able to be honest and have these really frank conversations with children. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's all of the questions I've got now, Vanessa. So thank, thank you. you very much. Me. Okay, brilliant. So um, we're we'll coming to the last five minutes now. So I just want you to make sure um, that we've, we've covered everything, Stacey, that you wanted mm -hmm. to um, talk yeah. about tonight. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, we have an amazing, wonderful website. We have yeah. a fantastic grief book. I don't think it works in my background. No, it doesn't, but it's yeah. a grief it book by Shelley Gilbert, mm -hmm. who's our founder. And it's great. There's so much information in there on photocopable pages that can be used in schools. So That's they're brilliant. really good resources. I think it's really important yeah. to have the right resources and, you know, be able to learn. Um, please look at our website. And also, you know, if you have any questions, my email is Stacey at Brief Encounter. So um, please, yeah. you know, let me know. Or if you have any requests, hopefully I'll be able to help. Yeah, it's great that that's, that information is all freely available, isn't it? Because so often yeah. it isn't available for people. So, you know, yeah. having that opportunity to be able to um, pull on some of the resources on your website and to make contact you, with you is, Absolutely. is great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anything from you, Nikki? Any final thoughts? No, just that we've been tweeting at Left, Right and Centre. So do, do feel free to have a look at these resources and um, yeah, follow up if you have any further questions, because we always like to hear from you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for having me. Good night, all. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.